Welcome back. In this lecture, we return to the study of the Middle Ages, and uh, we're really getting to a high point in the uh, Middle Ages in historical theology, because we're going to be looking at the life and works of Thomas Aquinas. And so once again, let me uh, get right to Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was born in his family's castle at Rocasica near Naples in 1244 or 1245, somewhere in there. The family had lived there since the 12th, uh, 10th century. His father was Count Landoff of an old high-born South Italian family, and his mother was Countess Theodora of Tiate of noble, uh, originally Lombards, of Norman descent. Uh, and the Normans had had been a northern uh, European tribe that had invaded uh, what was northern Italy uh, in the northeastern part of the country where now uh, Lombardy is. And so uh, those Italians weren't uh, dark-skinned uh, and Mediterranean looking like the rest of the uh, Italian peoples, but they were uh, light-skinned and had fair hair. Uh, but his family actually came from, as it says there, from the southern part of, uh, of uh, Italy near Naples. Uh, so there's some uh, uh, interesting sort of intermingling there in his family. About the age of five, Thomas was sent to the Benedictine monastery at Monte Cassino, where his uncle happened to be the abbot. In November of 1239, Thomas relocated to the University of Naples. That would be something closer to home. And at some point, it is said that his classmates referred to him as the dumb ox. This probably is the result of the fact that uh, pictures of him and descriptions of him were uh, that he wasn't very athletic looking, let's say. And, uh, and the way his uh, critical thinking appeared to be slow in pondering. So he wasn't a, he wasn't a glib, uh, but he was a deep thinker. And uh, so uh, just uh, some of those kind of uh, external characteristics uh, led to this rather unkind uh, characterization. However, later on, his uh, teacher, Albert the Great, said, one day this dumb ox will make a bellowing that will be heard throughout the world. And indeed, it was a sort of a statement of the fact that uh, you shouldn't judge a book by its covers or a student uh, and their intellectual capacity by how they look. In May of 1244, against his family's wishes, without his parents' approval, he became a novice in the Dominican order uh, on the way back to Rome, to on the way to Rome to receive his orders. He was actually abducted by his brothers and brought back to Ocasica, uh, where he was held for over a year in an attempt to try and change his mind about joining the Dominicans. Uh, it didn't work. He, uh, he stuck with his plans. Sometime after 1245, he began his studies under Albert the Great at the convent of St. James in Paris. Once more, one of those... Uh, those schools that had been started uh, earlier. In 1248, Aquinas and Albert started a school in Cologne, and Aquinas returned to Paris in 1252 to teach at the university. And then from 1259 to 1268, he taught at the papal cure in Naples. So uh, he did uh, a fair bit of uh, moving around in his uh, teaching career. He reigned there until 1261 when he began a position as lector at uh, Orievo, or, or Vieto, rather, in Italy. And this is the time when he completed his uh, first great Summa, the Summa Contra Gentiles. He began to write a Summa Theologia in 1266, but never really completed it, although it is a, a massive work uh, in spite of not being totally finished, according to his original plan. After spending some time in Rome and Viterbo, Aquinas went back to Paris in 1269, where he stayed until 1272. Once again, then, he returned to Naples as a regent of theology. Early in 1274, the Pope directed him to attend the Council of Lyon, and he undertook that journey, although he was far from uh, feeling well. And on the way, he stopped at the castle of a niece and became seriously ill. It was said that he wished to end his days in a monastery, and so not being able to reach the house of the Dominicans, which he was a part of, he was carried to the Cistercian uh, Fasanova, where he died on March the 7th, 1274. 
only at the age of 49. There's some question about whether he might have had something along the lines of a stroke or other uh, ailment, uh, not really sure. By the way, the uh, portrait that you see there is a very famous portrait which hangs in the Louvre in Paris. And uh, that actual, that, that what you see there is actually a photograph that I took uh, in the Louvre. Uh, so that one is one that's lifted off of the internet as many, as virtually all the other pictures you see are. Let's talk a little bit about his works. Uh, and this is only scratching the surface here. Uh, one author says, the writings of Thomas may be classified as exegetical, homiletical, and liturgical. Uh, this would be his, uh, basically theological writings. Dogmatic, apologetic, and ethical. Those would be his uh, practical writings and then philosophical. Thomas's writings are by and large shown by their provenance in his teaching duties. That is, uh, he wrote books that pertain to the courses that he was teaching and the studies that he was undertaking in the various schools where he was at. That is, they are writings we might expect from a scholarly teacher, not a Dominican brother or a pastor. So they were of a uh, very high uh, intellectual level. In 25 years of productive working life, Aquinas wrote or dictated over 8 million words, 2 million of which were commentaries on the Bible. He wrote transcripts of disputations, that is the public debates, uh, as we said, where the, uh, they would have debates in the scholastic uh, method they were talking about, where a rock star, that's my term, scholars, uh, would debate things, and the public was invited. This is one of those kind of things where most of the people in the audience wouldn't really understand, but it'd be very entertaining. In the Summa Theologia alone, he set out over 10,000 arguments against the positions he advocated and then answered them in detail. So there again, you can see the method that we were talking about earlier under scholasticism was where you would ask, a, you would posit a, uh, an argument, ask a question, you'd offer, you'd offer every argument for or against it on the other side, uh, and then you basically would uh, try to come to a conclusion from that. Thomas wrote several commentaries on Aristotle's works the Anima and Nicomachean Ethics. He was probably at home in Aristotle's world, a world that was saturated with a purposefulness, a world that meant was meant to be understood in the sense that, uh, that it is our nature as rational beings to inquire into the world's order and come to understand it. Uh, that, was, that was Aristotle's uh, endeavor to learn as much as you can about the world and try and understand it and, and be very rational and empirical in doing so. Thomas wrote a massive commentary on the sentences of Peter uh, Lombard. We saw him a little earlier. Uh, and Peter Lombard played a role in, in the development of uh, theology as a systematic discipline. So, I mean, basically, Lombard's sentences were a discussion of uh, uh, sentences or quotations from previous scholars uh, that then they would have debates on. And then Thomas wrote a, a, a massive commentary on all of that. So uh, an incredible amount of work. Uh, his most important works were the Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologia, as uh, we've said. Uh, his first Summa was the Summa Against the Gentiles. A Summa is just a complete or systematic acquisition. That's what's uh, meant by that term. In this book, Aquinas hoped to present the doctrines of Christianity in such a way that its opponents particularly Jews and Muslims, could be, would be rationally convinced of their truth. It was essentially a, a manual for apologetics and was intended to be used uh, by missionaries in their endeavor to uh, deal with, uh, again, uh, those that were uh, outside of uh, Christianity and maybe opponents of Christianity. So uh, he meant it to be a practical work. It's still very, a, a, a very uh, challenging theological work in spite of his intentions there. The Summa is not merely the, Summa Contra Gentiles, not merely the only complete Summa, because the Theologia wasn't complete, as I said, but was a uh, creative and even revolutionary work of apologetics, uh, composed at the precise moment when Christian thought needed to be intellectually creative to master and assimilate the intelligence and wisdoms of the Greeks and Arabs. What that means is that uh, 
at that time, a lot of the work of Arab philosophers was being used in uh, Christian universities. And it was actually through the Arabs that a lot of Aristotle's works came to be uh, rediscovered. Um, so uh, the Arabs had translated Aristotle's works into uh, from Greek to Arabic. And then uh, uh, scholars in the Western world found those Arabic texts and translated those Arabic texts into Latin. In the Summa, Aquinas' works uh, to save and purify the thought of the Greeks and Arabs in the higher light of the Christian revelation. In other words, to engage them apologetically, confident that all that had been rational in the ancient philosophers and their, and their philosophers and their followers would become more rational within Christianity. So you can see the enterprise there was to learn as much as you could from the Greeks and, and this time even the Arabs and see um, how that could be used to uh, better articulate and defend Christian theology. The Summa Theologia, Summary of Theology or Highest Theology, uh, is the most famous of Thomas's works. It was intended as a manual for beginners. So the other one was a manual for, for uh, uh, missionaries. This was basically his attempt to write uh, what we would call a catechism for beginners. Unbelievable. Uh, it summarizes the reasoning of all points of Christian theology, which uh, before the Protestant Reformation subsisted solely in Roman Catholic theology. So uh, basically here's an outline of the Summa's topics, the existence of God, God's creation, man's purpose, Christ, the sacraments, back to God. It's famous for its five arguments for the existence of God, which is in another set of notes uh, for which there is no lecture. I've just given you the notes on Thomas's five ways for you to look at it. I won't lecture on that. Uh, and throughout his work, Aquinas cites Augustine, Aristotle, other Christians. It's just a, a, a massive work. At one point, uh, uh, Aquinas said that he thanked God that uh, he never read a page of any other work that he didn't understand. Uh, and uh, he wasn't bragging. He was just uh, thanking God for that. And so the man used all of his massive intellectual capacities to write these uh, summas. After his first Summa, which was Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas began another, even more ambitious one, the Summa Theologia. It was never complete, massive as it was, but it would be his masterpiece. A definitive exposition of Christian doctrine, a distillation of 12 centuries of theology, sorted, categorized, commented on by Aquinas' ever-critical mind. The Summa is no dry, dogmatic exposition, but a journey of discovery. It takes the form, again, of a series of questions arranged thematically. For each question, we've seen this already, Aquinas considers a possible answer, presents a wide range of arguments in its favor, or against it, actually, to draw on from reason, scripture of the fathers, then analyzes the arguments, demolishes them, or affirms them, whichever forms an alternative answer to the question, supports it with arguments of its own. Just read that particular uh, note over again carefully and you'll understand a good summary of what uh, scholasticism and the Summa was all about. Well, we're going to stop there and uh, switch to uh, another lecture uh, on, uh, as it says there, on Aquinas' theological method.